Okay, uh, hello everyone once again. My name is Daisy Kusima. I am with HISP Uganda. And as HISP Uganda today, we shall be presenting uh, the use case on National Health Facility Quality of Care Assessment Program, commonly known as the HFQAP tool. HISP Uganda worked with Ministry of Health, Standards, Compliance and Patient Protection Department, as well as the Ministry of Health Division of, of Health Information and partners like uh, Makere University School of Public Health to customize the HFQAP tool using the DHIS2 tracker. The tool itself, the HFQAP tool itself was developed based on systematic review of the Yellow Star program, the service availability and readiness assessment, also known as the SARA tool and the health facility assessment tool. The tool has a total of 110 uh, service delivery standards and the assessment provides uh, allows supervisors to evaluate whether the health facility is compliant against each standard. So these standards are grouped into 10 modules uh, of which examples are the health financing module, the human resource module, the leadership and governance module, to mention but a few. So based on these modules, uh, like I said, standards are grouped into 10 modules and uh, percentage achievement is able to be calculated from each of these modules. And then the module scores are able to be summed to, to get the facility score. The main uh, objective of this tool is to provide uh, regular information on quality of care and the functionality for both public and private not-for-profit facilities. This helps to contribute to continuous quality improvement. With this tool, we are able to generate information on status of service delivery. We are able to generate the level of performance for health facilities based on the different service delivery standards. And we're also able to determine the performance of health facilities based on their star ratings. So previously, before customization using DHIS2 aggregates, uh, data from this tool was being captured using sorry, before, you, before customization into DHIS2 tracker, the data was being captured using DHIS2 aggregate. So what would happen is that the data would be collected from uh, the health facility during the assessment. It would be collected on a paper tool, and then it would be entered into the system either at district or national level. This presented challenges with uh, data analysis, given that some of the data captured is categorical in nature. So in order to analyze the data, what the Ministry of Health would do is to download the data using the API and then do further analysis uh, using external analysis tools like Excel, Stata, and others. This also presented a challenge in providing health facilities with uh, information on their performance in real time. So they would have to wait for this analysis to be done so that they could then know how they are performing or the results of the assessment. So uh, the Ministry of Health realized a need to do this analysis using the inbuilt DHIS2 analytic tools. That's the decision to move it to DHIS2 tracker. So currently, uh, data is being captured using, the DHI, using a DHIS2 tracker-based program. Android, uh, the DHIS2 Android capture app is being used. And uh, what happens is that the assessors go to the facilities to conduct this assessment with tablets that have this DHIS2 Android capture app on there. So they are able to conduct the assessment as they're entering the data into the system. And as such, they're able to get the module scores since the, the module scores are calculated during the assessment, as we shall see when we're looking at the DHIS2 features used. Uh, we are also able to calculate the star scores using uh, the indicators within DHIS2, and one is able to pull the analysis from pivot tables, data visualizer, and more. This has also brought the ability for further and uh, deeper analysis to be done using event reports, seeing as uh, users are able to get into the event reports, get to a particular standard, and see the areas of weakness that they need to improve on and also able to see their strengths 
This has also helped in continuous quality improvement. So the DHIS2 features that this system leverages on, uh, first of all, it's the DHIS2 tracker program. Uh, what's happening is that the system is a, is a DHIS2 tracker program. Like I said, uh, the tool is based on multiple 10 modules, and these modules have been customized as program stages in DHIS2 tracker, as we are able to see within this image here. So every module is captured as a program stage, and one is able to go ahead and enter this data in there. We have also made use of the DHIS2 uh, Android Capture app, like I mentioned. It is the one that uh, data is entered, is used, it is the one that is used to enter data at the facilities during the assessment. We have made use of the program rules within DHIS2 to ensure that we are capturing data that is of good quality. So uh, we, had, we have different scenarios, there are different standards that apply to different health facility levels. For example, you find that a particular standard applies to a health center four, but does not apply to a health center two. Uh, for example, maternal health, that is not really uh, done at health center twos. So as such, we made use of the program rules to ensure that when an assessment is being done, if one is at a health center two, they are only seeing questions that are applicable to a health center two. We also made use of the skip, uh, sorry, those were the skip logics. And then we also made use of the assign value program action because there are some questions whose uh, response is determined by a response given to a previous question. So to ensure that quality data is captured, we assigned values based on whatever question was answered before. We made use of program indicators to calculate scores which were displayed in real time for feedback given to health facilities. So uh, module scores as seen here in this image, the module scores are calculated and displayed within the assessment dashboard. They're also viewable from the, they're also viewable from the, the DHIS2 Android Capture app. So, uh, that made it possible for the assessors to be able to give feedback to the health facilities during the assessment, other than having to wait for later for the health facilities to know their performance on the assessment. Uh, we made use of the <coughs> aggregate indicators to calculate scores for facilities, districts, and regional comparisons. So with the aggregate indicators, we since we had uh, program indicators for the module and standard scores, we used the aggregate indicators to come up with the star scores for the different facilities. Then we used event reports. We used the event reports as Alia mentioned for partners and the ministry and district level to be able to deep dive into the data and identify where there is need for improvement. This is all, you uh, helpful in the continuous quality improvement of care within the health facilities. Finally, we have the DHIS2 dashboards, which are accessible to all users. So these dashboards are able to display the performance of the different facilities. We have one dashboard here that shows the module scores and the star performance by the different facilities. We're able to see the facilities that are in red. We're able to see facilities that are in yellow and those that are in green. So this is uh, points the facilities to which areas they need to improve on. It also points the district to the areas that as a district they would need to improve on and therefore helps in decision-making. We're also able to see performance by the different standards on our dashboards. So this tool uh, is being used countrywide. It's being used by all districts in the country to assess public and private not-for-profit health facilities currently. We have uh, 131 users ranging from Ministry of Health all the way down to the district. Then there are also different types of assessment that are captured within this system. Uh, we have assessments that are held at ministry level and uh, those are ministry led. 
So those are able to be captured. Then we have assessments that are led by the districts. For example, if a district decides they would need to do an assessment and find out how they're doing as a district, how they're performing as a district. Then we have partner-led health facility assessments. These, facility, these, these uh, assessments by the partners most times are focusing on a particular module. For example, if a partner is supporting uh, in supporting the human resource of health facilities, they're able to get into the system and do an assessment on only that, just that one module. And then we also have the health facility self-assessments, whereby a facility wants to assess itself and see its performance. So here we have an image of the data entry screen at the point of re registering an assessment. We, are, we have an assessment type where we are able to capture whether it is a national assessment, a self-assessment or a modular assessment. So how was this rolled out? Uh, first of all, this whole process started from the Tracker Academy in 2019 that was held in Chigali. So what happened is that there were participants from the Ministry of Health Division of Health Information Department, from the Ministry of Health SCAP D Department, as well as partners. Uh, during one of the sessions, we were asked to, as a country, sit down and discuss on one tool that we could uh, customize in DHIS to tracker. So the participants from the SCAP D department shared with us this HF Club tool, shared with us the challenges that they were facing with the tool, and therefore we agreed that it would be best that we customize it in DHIS2 Tracker. Of course, there was need for uh, the ministry as a whole, the SCAPD department as a whole to agree, which they did. And we began our joint customization workshops in July, 2020. So uh, we're able to see an image of one of the joint customization workshops there. Um, within these workshops, we had to sit down again look at the tool again, look at the key indicators that the, the SCAPD department would like to have pulled out of the system, and then agree on whether event or tracker-based program would be the best, of which we agreed that tracker, tracker would be the best since it was a, it's a really, really big tool, and it would be difficult to have as just a single event. And then also we went ahead to look at the indicators, agree which one would have as a program indicator, which one would have as an aggregate indicator, agree on what we would have on our dashboards, and then of course started on the customization work. After this, uh, after the customization work was done, we did field testing. So this field testing was aimed at trying out the tool within a facility, seeing uh, how, what the assessment process would go like while using the Android Capture app, and then also making the system refinements based on the feedback there. So this field testing was done by the customization team. Uh, one of the members of the team is here. It was done by the customization team. We picked uh, nearby facilities. Like I mentioned, different standards apply to different health facility levels. So we had to ensure that we picked uh, different facilities that are of different facility levels. And we went out there and did a mock assessment with some of the health workers. So with this, we were able to get um, an idea of what the user experience would be like in the field with the tool, and also get uh, ideas on what we needed to improve in the tool. In November 2020, a team was selected to pilot this, this tool, and uh, the pilot was conducted in the West Nile region of Uganda, and it was uh, it covered 363 facilities. Based on the feedback given, changes were made to the system to improve it as well. Then in July 2021, we had a training uh, for a team that was going to go out for a ministry-led assessment. This assessment was covering 1,086 health facilities across the country. Now, during the pilot and this uh, large assessment, there was continuous support given to the assessment teams by the customization team, as well as the Ministry of Health IT team, which had been trained in use of the system and as well uh, pulling out of data from the system. So this support, uh, we created WhatsApp groups where people were able to share any challenges first. And of course, there were also phone calls to support them. Uh, of course, we also had a manual 
uh, manual or brief SOP that was created to, to, for these field teams to go out with that they could refer to in case they faced any challenges. So this is a picture from one of the assessments. Challenges first. Um, there were two major challenges first. One of them is the Android app performance. Like I mentioned, we developed, uh, we customized program indicators, but some of the modules had a large, large number of uh, questions, and that's a large number of data elements. So as such, you would find that the program indicator is really, really complex, and therefore there's going to be some processing issues with uh, generating the figure coming from it. An example of these indicators is this one here. We are able to see the number of uh, data elements that are being used in the calculation of this indicator. So this posed the problem, also the number of program rules. So this posed the problem, especially when it came to the health supplies, medicines and equipment module, which has about 500 data elements. What would happen is during the assessment, uh, when, they got, when assessors would get to that module, the app would either crash or, um, it would either crash or the, the tablet would slow down. So what we are trying to do, or what we are planning to do for this is to split that big module into three program stages so that the processing burden is uh, cut across the different program stages rather than being on just one program stage. The other challenge faced is that uh, since assessors were assessing more than one facility, there are times that they would move from one facility to another and forget to ensure that the modules, when they're entering the modules data, the right facility is selected. So as such, you would have some modules being attached to different facilities than what their data is for. For example, you have an enrolling facility as maybe Mukono Health Center 4, but then you're seeing the module score is being attached to a different uh, health facility. So with that, we had to emphasize in the trainings that at the point of entering modules, users have to be careful and ensure that they have checked that the right, um, the right facility is selected. We also generated a Python script that would uh, ensure that all the modules or events are attached to the enrollment facility. So it would just switch all events to their enrollment facility. Way forward, um, SCAP department, together with uh, districts and partners, will continue to use the tool to conduct assessments and provide system improvement feedback. We also hope to incorporate private health facility assessment needs. Um, private health facilities have some assessment needs that are unique to them and do not apply to public facilities and private not-for-profit facilities. For example, there is equipment that, is ex that uh, private facilities are able to have that pu public facilities do not have, or they have differences in their, uh, their human resource, they have differences in their financing channels. So as such, we have to find a way to incorporate their assessment needs within the system so that it can be used across all facilities, regardless of whether they are private facilities or public facilities. Then we hope to digitize uh, client exit interviews into the system. We hope to cascade training in information and data use from the district to health facility teams and other users of the system. We really, really hope that uh, facilities can be able to master the system and be able to use it for their quality improvement, use the data from the system for their quality improvement. Seeing as we previously mentioned, they are able to get into uh, event reports and see the areas where they need to improve. It, it would be good if their capacity is built so that they can continuously use the system and aim to improve their quality of, of care. Daisy? Then, uh, yes, please. One minute remaining, sorry. <laughs> okay, sorry. So uh, the last point is that we hope to train and empower the SCAP department team to manage the system and then hand it over to them. This is a ministry of, of uh, it is a ministry of health system. So we really uh, hope to empower the SCAP department 
train them, get them to be comfortable with the system, get them to know how they can make use of the data in the system, how they can do their analysis, and then finally hand it over to them so that they can run the show. Uh, I think that's mostly it from uh, HISP Uganda. We thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. And we welcome any questions, comments, and suggestions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daisy, for this uh, wonderful presentation from uh, HISP uh, Uganda. Um, due to the time limitations which we have, uh, we um, we encourage participants to use the Slack channel to post any questions which you have. Um, the participants, the facilitators will try their level best to kind of respond in the Slack in real time while we are conducting this uh, session. So please feel free to uh, post your questions on the Slack. Um, next is a presentation from uh, HISP um, Rwanda. Uh, our colleague Jean Paul will. Um, uh, present a uh, use case. Welcome, Jean Paul. I think Jean Paul needs to be co host in order to share his screen. Can someone take care sure. of that? Uh, hello, everyone. I... Yes, please. Ah. Someone can help me. Daisy, uh, Jean Paul Hataki Gimena. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much. This is Jean-Paul Atedikimana from Hispi Rwanda. Uh, it's my uh, pleasure to be on this platform to share with you uh, all about uh, how Hispi Rwanda, in partnership with the Ministry of Health, uh, contributed for COVID case surgeons and response by developing and implementing the COVAX and the COVID-19 tracker. Uh, I will be sharing with you the, what was the gap and the, what was the proposed solution and how the solution tried to contribute for uh, case surveillance and response and uh, what was the results and uh, what is the way forward. Of course, by discussing also a bit about the challenges and the descendant from the process of implementing this uh, COVAX and the of COVID-19 uh, instances. Um, as uh, other countries, the government of Rwanda was uh, fully involved uh, in the implementation of uh, different solutions so that uh, it can uh, 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 contribute to the service and response and uh, fight against the COVID-19 from the citizens of Rwanda. And uh, before the pandemic, um, there were no uh, tangible system uh, which can help to be used uh, in surface and response. Uh, of course, uh, we have had uh, an IDSL system which used to collect data for immediate disease, but it was not uh, ready to solve all um, issues related to the pandemic due to its uh, complexity. So uh, the MOH uh, with the, the support from the ISP Rwanda was developed, uh, has developed the COVID instances and uh, up to now we still, uh, we are still collaborating to see how we can provide support for enhancement uh, required for the two instances, both for COVID-19 Savian system and um, uh, instance for vaccination. Uh, maybe uh, looking a bit on the structure of coordination can wonder for all activities related to the service and response uh, regarding COVID-19. The country put in place the national coordination structure 
and uh, you will see on this structure that uh, there is uh, a unit uh, of service where there is a data management. And of course, data management was very complicated using paper-based uh, system. Um, uh, using this paper-based system and also considering considering uh, considering that uh, the COVID preparedness and the response uh, here in Rwanda is structured in this way, where the first activity and the first principle here is to detect the suspected cases uh, on time. And those who are suspected, uh, they are tested. And uh, uh, being tested, um, either those who are suspected they are put in isolation or in quarantine, and uh, after being tested, either you become uh, confirmed or uh, negative. And for those who are confirmed, they are put in treatment center, or even this time, those without uh, symptoms, uh, they, they remain at home. And also, from those confirmed cases, uh, they are contact tracing and. Uh, uh, for after contact tracing, they are tested, they are followed up within four hours. Those with symptoms, they are put in quarantine. Those without symptoms, uh, we end up they follow up. So considering these uh, steps uh, uh, to care about the suspect cases and using also paper-based systems, it was not easy. Uh, that's why uh, uh, here, this is the manual process with paper forms from the field. You see, uh, when, uh, at the time when we are using the paper based system, those uh, who were supposed to go to the field for testing, they went with this paper for information correction. You see, these are laboratory tools. And uh, on these sample collection tools, they, are, they were supposed to develop a kind of Unicode manual which was not really very easy. So this is the case investigation form used uh, for the paper-based system. And uh, uh, filling this uh, case investigation form, it takes like between 10 and 15 minutes, which was not very easy due to the queue of persons uh, to be tested. So uh, you, uh, manual testing for um, engaged, uh, different challenges like uh, very long process without a necessary with a necessary flaws, difficult process during spacement process. Um, it was also hard to trace urgent samples or specific samples due to the manual work involved. Manual process of, of a lab ID and uh, this also involved uh, some duplications. There were a risk of duplicating lab ID and from that, you may even uh, issue uh, testing results from the wrong person. So that, that's one of the challenges from the manual testing. Less of results and uh, clients were not happy. Uh, much work to lab take from sample collection to results. Actually, these are uh, some of the challenges. So from that, is Pirwanda but, uh, collaborating with the Ministry of Health, we are supposed to find solutions. And uh, that's why from the, from the above challenges identified, we decided to develop a um, COVID-19 uh, case-based surveillance system with the following, uh, these are some of the features. Uh, this system has the capacity of feature uh, of printing out results uh, we have also passenger locator form to facilitate people from outside or those who want to go abroad. They, they may fill the form online and reaching to the airport, they, they are tested without any delay. We have also feature of SMS and emails, notification for registration and issuing results. There is a certificate uh, portal where after being tested, someone can get a, a certificate of um, uh, testing results without delaying, just by downloading. Then there's a self-registration form without, just to reduce time and lines at testing sites. And uh, we have also an Android app scanning travel certificate because 
uh, it's, uh, it was necessary to enable verification um, features so that uh, when someone is tested and reaching to the airport is to verify the information, if the information are similar to those in the system. So there is also an integrated online payment of lab tests for arrivals so that when you reach at the airport, you can pay easily using online payment methods. Um, so these are the different features in the system. And uh, uh, these system features are designed considering the physical reality on the field, where they are, uh, the system has the clinical exam and the diagnosis module, lab request module, sample request, sample processing, lab results, lab confirmed cases, lab uh, COVID-19 test, and um, lab test, hospitalization, and uh, health outcome. Uh, so this system uh, has considered all process occurred on the field. Uh, so these are some of the photos on the field, uh, which are considered as um, output and the results uh, developed uh, while we wanted to end up the problem related to the paper-based systems. Fluid sample corrections. Here, staff, uh, RBC and the MOH staff were correcting uh, sample in the field. These are the clinicians and these are the clients. And uh, this is the, how the sample reception st workstations is, where um, activities are to, re uh, to receive samples from the uh, clients, checking the lab codes. Actually, here, uh, this system is uh, generating automatically the lab codes, which are here a unique uh, patient unique ID. Then uh, confirm that sample are of good quality, no rejections. So here in the system, there is a modular for sample exception. Then um, this is also how sample are processed. And uh, after processing the sample in the laboratory, they have also to field sample processing information in the system. Uh, this is how uh, unique ID generated by the system is put on the lab uh, sample collection space uh, tool so that uh, they will be able to identify uh, clients uh, without any confusion. And uh, this is uh, how the uh, team in charge of uh, entering results in the system are working. And after entering results in the system, uh, a client will receive, is receiving the SMS, and this SMS will lead them to download to the link where they are able to download the certificate of their result certificate of their test. And uh, you can see that uh, they are allowed to put their phone number and unique ID so that they can download their test results. And uh, this is the test results. And you can see here that there is uh, an option QR code so that this QR code has to be uh, verified to see if really the information are similar to one in the system. Uh, you see that here, uh, there is a uh, the way to scan a certificate for travelers at the airport. And then this is the dashboard to monitor the testing uh, figures. So these are uh, the summary of uh, system implementation and achievements. And uh, to achieve all this, uh, the government has put in place the National Chain Task Force, which includes also data science unit. So they are package implemented countrywide and the capacity build try to conduct the capacity building uh, both for the users and the leaders involved in the surveys uh, system. Uh, government uh, dis uh, distributed uh, around uh, 500 tablets and uh, 200 smartphones across the country to facilitate data collection. We have had uh, more than uh, eight eight PCR lab testing sites, integrated system, and the paper-based uh, system used before. 
Uh, this SMS and email notification was really helped a lot to communicate with the entire uh, population of the country. The integrated online payment of lab tests also for arrivals has facilitated time management at the airport, at the entry points. Certificate port also uh, managed uh, and helped the, the population to manage their time uh, by downloading themselves the certificate. And the Android app for scanning the travel certificate helped the authentication of uh, information in the airport. So general challenge of using this system or for the side of users, uh, each and every app that's required, we need to update the users and uh, they had to reach each and every users, but we adopted to use uh, online uh, channels like social media to inform all users at the same time. And the high number of data entry crates during the mass testing was also an issue, but we managed it by using uh, different um, public staffs to uh, intervene during the data entry crates during the mass, uh, during the data entry uh, sessions during the mass testing. Then some uh, challenges using Android apps specifically were identified, like uh, budget for internet bundles, like uh, uh, end on application configuration requires users data collection to be informed. And uh, the Android app is mainly for capture data users. It can't have a quick uh, dashboard for dialogue work done. Uh, all those, these are the challenges identified. And uh, these are the lessons learned using the Android apps specifically. Actually, we have seen that the HS200 it simplifies the process and speed up the services. Then the offline use of Android app uh, is very useful in remote areas. And the free speed and portability of those uh, tablets, it was also an, uh, an asset for us. And the uh, lab specimen processing and tracing agent samples, it was very easy and uh, it was improved by using this uh, Android app. Uh, power battery or uh, autonomy of 12 hours for those uh, used tablets was very helpful for us. Uh, all those are the identified um, Listen then uh, during the implementation of this Android app or during the COVID-19 uh, testing. Uh, I just want to share with you also the other instance of uh, the HSU vaccine registry, where um, uh, during the vaccination of this COVID, uh, it was uh, not easy to use the public system. That's why in partnership with the Ministry of Health, we decided to develop the instance to be used. The steps here, uh, it was the, um, uh, for the deployment, we started by configuring the metadata and uh, we tested and upgraded the version, then the rollout. Then after its approval, we prepared the site so that they can start using this uh, instance. And after that, this is how it was on the field. Uh, at, at each and every Paul. site. Yeah, yes, Hello, John Paul. You, have, you have one minute remaining. Sorry. Yes, please. Yes. So each, at each and every site, the workflow of vaccination, uh, there's a client started by um, reaching to the site, and uh, even the SP Rwanda participated to help the uh, users. Uh, you see that data entry team here, they sent the client and they, uh, they sent the SMS to the client. After the client receives the SMS, he go for vaccination loop, and after being vaccinated in observation loop for allowed 15 minutes, and he receives the SMS and certificate by downloading himself or herself. Um, these are the vaccination site, how it is. Then this is after receiving the SMS, uh, download the certificate, this is the certificate, and the QR code for authenticating the data in the certificate, uh, these are the uh, these are the teams participated to make all those uh, happen. 
And uh, the way forward, we are aiming to integrate both uh, instances, the two instances, for the one for testing and the other one for vaccination, to put in, in, in one integrated system. Thank you very much. Uh, that was the presentation, and uh, I welcome your comments and your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Rwanda, for a very good and enlightening presentation, especially on these times of um, COVID pandemic, how you have digitalized your um, solution and used it uh, to help in these um, difficult times. Now, uh, as I said before, our time is a little bit limited and um, we, we, if you have any questions, please use Slack. I've started to see some questions from participants on the Slack. The, the facilitators will be responding to these questions shortly. Now, uh, let me invite uh, Tiwonge Manda from um, his Malawi for his presentation. All right, uh, thanks, Wilfred. Yeah, so good afternoon, everyone. I trust you're able to see uh, my screen. So I'll be talking about the uh, National Agriculture Management Information System for Malawi, so abbreviated as, as NAMIS. So essentially, uh, that's like the web landing page for the, for the system. And in terms of what I'm going to talk about, so we'll just look at the, the background leading to development of the system, uh, system features, issues around implementation and challenges faced and how uh, some were tackled and then uh, future plans. So um, in Malawi, so this uh, work was done under the Ministry of Agriculture. So with the Ministry of Agriculture, what as frontline workers, you have now what are called extension workers. So extension workers work at community level. So like at household level, they'll provide um, advice on agriculture or households and also collect different kinds of data at, at household level. So these processes are largely paper-based. And also when you compare the level of uh, digitalization within the Ministry of Agriculture and other uh, government entities such as the Ministry of Health, uh, the, the Ministry seems to be uh, lagging behind in terms of uh, digitalization. But in its planning, the Ministry of Agriculture has seen the enhancement of the monitoring systems as a key component to the drive for commercialization of agriculture. So under this, then it was seen that there's need to develop a consolidated uh, digital management information system that provides a platform for all work processes under the, the ministry. So I think before we also had sort of like um, standalone uh, small systems, some of which have been discontinued. So under this current vision for the development of an integrated system, the ministry wants a configurable system that can expand beyond uh, single use cases. And also the other key thing here was to have data entry and use at the lowest point of service delivery. So because the ministry was looking for a tool that people could use as they go about delivering their work. So Tracker rendered itself yeah, better than the aggregate component. So when you look at Malawi, for example, the first use case for implementation within the Ministry of Health was the aggregate use case. But because of the target audience uh, for the Ministry of Agriculture, so the focus was on, on tracker. And uh, just as a guide, so as of now, we have like a total of over 23,000 uh, reporting system, I mean, reporting units within the, the system. So like offices, service areas. So service areas are demarcations in terms of where these extension workers uh, provide their services. So at the lowest level, you have what are called blocks and 
blocks are organized into sections and extension planning areas and then districts and so on and so forth. So we also have um, markets. So for the collection of agricultural uh, statistics, such as market information on commodities, and then there are also weather stations for the reporting of uh, weather and climate data. And then there are landing sites and stratum for fisheries and so on and so forth. So with this work, uh, it's been organized in, in phases. So there have been uh, two phases of development so far, starting from uh, 2018. So focusing on the first was called the agricultural market information system. So the agricultural market information system uh, mainly focuses on monitoring um, market information for agricultural products. So there are five uh, survey forms for, for that. I think you see that uh, in a short while. And then there's also what's called the um, agricultural production estimate survey. So each year, the country performs uh, agricultural production estimates. So on crops, uh, fisheries, life, and livestock dynamics. So this is just to forecast what the outlook in terms of uh, food security is going to, to be. So this is done in several rounds. And then from there, the, net, uh, the national project, whether it's going to be uh, food sufficient or there is some interventions that are necessary. And then we also have uh, service areas for animal health, so daily monitoring of animal health and uh, outbreaks. And then there's also uh, a form for rapid food situation assessment at a household level, just to see whether the household is okay or they will need some emergency uh, food intervention. And then the other component is on fisheries. So covering all areas on uh, fisheries management. And then there's also uh, weather data reporting. So because as you know, agriculture is weather and uh, climate sensitive, so that's essential. And also in, in terms of the work that's been performed, there's been a development of uh, a web portal. So accessibility of the collected data was deemed critical, so hence uh, uh, prioritization of the web portal. And besides, they are requested for system features and um, the survey forms. We've also, in the process, I think, um, come up with various uh, custom apps to improve on the development processes. So, for example, with that uh, graduate production estimate survey, one key thing is to do household and block sampling for the purposes of running this survey. So for that, we developed an app that uh, does that automatically. And then for various purposes of you know, user account management. So for example, mass enrolling of users to some user groups or management of user passwords and so on and so forth. We also uh, developed some uh, custom app to expedite some processes. And one key thing is that in the development of the various tools that I've talked about, we were in implementing uh, survey protocols or service delivery protocols. So to do that, uh, that meant that we needed to configure, for example, a program skip logic to guide the behavior of the app based on user input. And within Tracker to do that, you have you use program rules. And the, for the program rule expressions, you have to create a program of rule variables, which are mapped to the uh, Tracker data elements. So this can be quite cumbersome because within a system, you generally do one variable at a time. So what we did was to develop an app for mass uh, creation of program rule variables. So you can create, for example, all the program rule variables for a particular survey form uh, with, with a single click, for example. And then another process is that also when you're organizing the, the forms, you have to organize, let's say, 
sections into themes and that can also be uh, quite cumbersome. So we developed an app for that so that we can manage those sort of processes in a single screen. And also to help uh, some supervisors to preview collected data. So we did some small app for tracker data uh, previewing. And then there also some app for uh, processing Excel files in terms of uh, managing the import of historical data. And one challenge that we also faced was that in the development and testing of things, we generated a lot of test data, which needed cleaning up after. So the manual deletion of uh, this data was proving to be time consuming. So there was also some small app developed in terms of uh, data cleanup. All right. So in terms of what's been uh, implemented in the system, I think also one thing is uh, besides the, the key modules, uh, this effort has developed, I mean, has helped in, in terms of uh, consolidating key data, like for all the reporting units, because uh, in some cases, the ministry didn't have data for all the reporting units in, in one place. But with the development of this system, now the data on reporting units is in one place. So for the over 23,000 units that I talked about. And now uh, also, then the development and rollout of the gradual market information system in 12 districts and also done um, importation of historical data. And for this farming season, uh, some districts have started implementation of the agricultural production estimate survey. So that season uh, started last month. So we're still getting uh, some feedback from the field. And there's also the, the portal, which I'll show you in a short while. And as part of the process, there have been uh, numerous technical and end user training sessions. So mainly to develop uh, technical capacity on DHIS2 and related processes within the Ministry of Agriculture, because this is uh, the first wide implementation of uh, DHIS2. Okay, uh, so, right, so, yes, the system development and integration guide is meant to guide the ministry in, in terms of considering new efforts for systems uh, development. So then uh, next we have just a series of uh, some screenshots for the system. So as I said, we have um, a landing portal for, for the system. So this is the, the landing page. And also what's here, one can access uh, the library. So the, the library is meant to house all the key uh, documents within the ministry, such as policies and reports. And that uh, link for NAMIS then gets them to the uh, main system. So for the statistics and analytics, those lead to uh, a dashboard for key statistics and also a page where people can do their own uh, analytics within the, the system. And then you have a page for, for news and also a, a directory for uh, key partner links. So uh, here's a sample screen for the, for the portal. So essentially what this displays is that it displays uh, some configured dashboards within the system that have been uh, shared for uh, the, the public to get access to, to data. And for the uh, tools developed, so as I said, you have uh, the a graduate market information um, system tools. 
So what you can do an agricultural input market survey. So looking at the prices of agricultural inputs, uh, farm get survey, then you also have the food crops and meat products, retail market survey. So for all these I army mean, surveys, uh, enumerators go to markets to get uh, that sort of information. Then there's also uh, a household register. So for getting household uh, dynamics. So to your right, you have those two screens on like what sort of data is collected for a household. And then we also have uh, various forms for monitoring livestock uh, dynamics. So everything about livestock that a household may keep. Um, so these are just expansions of what's being collected for the yeah, livestock forms as a sample of some functionality provided by the system. So like this form A1 and A6, collect everything that the household would that possibly keep. And then let's say based on what sort of livestock the household keeps, then you can get to specific forms like that one on good population and dynamics to get further details on that, or if it's on cattle or whatever other animals, as you can see on the extreme left, you can then go ahead and collect that sort of data. Uh, so I think for developing this system functionality, one key thing was to leverage existing systems. I think like the, the tracker and the uh, Android capture, because that saved a lot of development time, but we also leveraged uh, a lot of other custom apps like the extended user management app from the, the uh, DHIS2 app store. So for the implementation, the implementation of the, the modules is being done in a first manner because this is a countrywide system, but and everything can be implemented uh, at once. So as I said, we first implemented the agriculture market information system components, and then with this uh, rainy season, we implementing the agricultural production estimate surveys. And this is also being done in a first manner across districts. So like that agricultural market information system was implemented in 12 districts, and then it will be gradually scaled to other districts. So uh, in terms of challenges, I think some key things relate to the level of uh, DHS to technical capacity, this being the first system within the Ministry of Agriculture. But what has been done is we've had uh, several workshops in terms of uh, developing technical capacity of IT staff, as well as developing a capacity for end users. And also this being a national system, one key thing is trying to align uh, funding cycles to make sure that the system is scaled to all the uh, districts in country. And also in a context where you have multiple implementation uh, partners as donors funding initiatives, there's also the challenge of trying to align parallel efforts that may be doing the, the same thing. But the good thing is that also agriculture thing for digitalization is in the early stages. So that's in a way manageable at, at this stage. So another challenge has been uh, I think back fixing timelines within the uh, main DHIS2 component versus uh, local time sensitivity. So an example is that uh, with the release of the, the new version, I think like the form names were not displaying. So we we're about to roll out an implementation. So that's in a way delayed our rollout, but at least we were able to link up with the global team and that was eventually resolved. And then uh, the DHIS 200 capture app performance can be an issue at times. So I think forms are heavy, as was the, the case with uh, his Uganda, the app does crash at, at times. And also in some cases, it forces you to choose in terms of uh, the usability of things where you can, like as to how many rules, program rules you should have to make the app dynamic or which is likely to affect performance or what you should leave out, which may in turn affect uh, usability. And then another thing that we've noticed is that uh, terminology of the DHIS 200 capture in as much as it's uh, meant to be generic, but leans a bit more towards the health domain. So I think we've engaged with the global team on that as well to change some things uh, in, in, in due course. And another key challenge has been the uh, quality of available documentation, especially on, on tracker and uh, program indicators. So you 
tend to spend a lot of time trying to figure things out. So I think that's an area for possible collaboration and improvement of things. And uh, in terms of um, future plans and ongoing efforts, so we're working on continuing to roll out and expansion of the modules that have been developed and also to further develop uh, technical capacity and to mobilize uh, funding for further development as well as to strengthen system development uh, governance structure so that we don't have a duplication of efforts. And then also to facilitate linkage across ministries because the uh, expertise across ministries and so lessons can be also learned from what other ministries have done and the ministries can also collaborate on some things. So for example, in health, uh, the frontline workers collect data on households in agriculture. The frontline workers are also collecting uh, data on households and this is pretty much very similar data. So there could be some partnership or realignment of improve on operations. So uh, Zico, and thank you for, for your attention. Thank you, Tiwonge, uh, for the nice presentation. Um, participant, as usual, please um, post your questions on the Slack. The channel is questions. Um, just post there, and then you can tag also a particular facilitator who you want to, or who you're aiming your question to. Now, the next presenter will be uh, Wesley from um, his Kenya. Uh, he'll be presenting um, their use case. Uh, Wesley, welcome. Oh, so thank you very much. I hope I can be able to look at, my, share my screen and you can be able to see. So my name is Wesley and I'll be able to make a presentation on how we are using the tracker in Kenya to do a rapid mortality survey for purposes of reporting the excess mortality that we've been able to see, especially with the advent of COVID. Let me hope everyone can hear me and the screen is visible. So just a little background of information is that in Kenya, the Department of Civil Registration is mandated with the task of registering all the births and deaths that apply in care as per according to one of our laws, Act 149 of Kenya. And the death, Kenya registration is done on the basis of where the death has occurred, such that the death that occurs at health facility is able to be captured and reported within the health facility. And that that happens within the community, someone who's dying at home, the data of that particular death will be able to be reported in a different system, which is basically leveraging on the provincial administration. As it is at the moment in Kenya, it's important to note that we are experiencing a very, sorry, we are, experiencing, we are experiencing a very low reporting rate of deaths. That is the reporting of all deaths as for now, our coverage in 2018 was only 42%. We went down in 2019 to 38, and in 2020, we went way below, which is at 37.1. So this significant variation in county specific coverages is also something to note that Nairobi, which is our capital city, has one of the highest reporting rates, whereas the other counties like Siaya and Kajiado are very, very, very low. Important to note that as we look at this, the reporting of deaths is one of the key things that is envisioned in the SDG targets for which the SDG expects us to at least to be able to register at least 80% of deaths appearing or occurring within our country. And uh, clearly as a country, we are very far from this. And that is why we had to mandate or to develop a tool that would be able to be used by health workers in health facility so that at least we could transition ourselves to 100% reporting for facility deaths as we keep working on the challenges of what happens at community death. So the rationale of why this particular thing was is that we need to inform decision makers about the full magnitude of the health consequences of COVID-19. I think most of you are aware of the COVID-19 and the number of deaths that have been appearing. So we need to tell the policy makers, for example, for the people coming to the hospital, are we seeing excess deaths? And this is by done by ensuring, first of all, be able to capture all the deaths that are happening. And once we transition it into the system, we'll be able to compare with retrospective data for the deaths that were occurring before COVID and be able to determine or ascertain are we experiencing any excess deaths. 
at this particular moment. So the, it enables the capturing of mortality data in real time manner, which is mainly daily to enable monitoring of population trends and inform public health measures. And it will help us as a system as health to build capacity in the civil registration system. And the effort is to ensure maximum benefit of routine data system to policy. Our broad objective when we were rolling this particular app within the KHIS tracker instance is to do, was to rapidly generate timely quality data during the COVID-19 pandemic with the aim of strengthening death and cost of death notification and registration in Kenya. I think most of you will be aware that by the time the WHO had released the ICD-11 code for COVID, most of the COVID deaths had already been reported and largely or and by mistake or by default, a good number of them had been allowed to come in and be reported as just deaths due to pneumonia or any of those particular areas. So other objectives for this particular area is that we needed to streamline timely reporting of mortality notification from health facility level to improve our coverage of completeness of death and cost of death. As I'll be able to show you through the forms that we have developed within the system, we do realize that a number of deaths will be able to be reported, but the cost of death, the sequencing of the death was an issue and we needed to develop something that could be able to capture this very, very fast as we move ahead. We also needed to determine the excess mortality, as I said earlier, and actually showcase synergy and integration of existing mortality surveillance, because as I've clearly stated, working in the Ministry of Health, our core mandate is not the registration of deaths and birth and deaths, but you will agree with me that by unfortunate means, those two events largely occur in the health facility, depending on the health-seeking behavior of our population. So <clears throat> this being a pilot thing as a surveillance, we need to select a number of counties within Kenya that, where we could quickly go in and be able to deliver this particular uh, deployment of the KHIS to be able to report. So we had a number of factors we had to consider before we could pick up on our facility. We looked at COVID-19 high burden. That is to mean that, for example, for this pilot, which we've been able to roll out, we looked at counties which are having a high COVID burden based on the PCR reports we were collecting on the country. We also captured data on the counties that were on border counties. And I think our neighbors, Kenya, our neighbors to Kenya who are Tanzania and Uganda, those were the main interests for us because the other ones of the Northern frontiers were not keen. So Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania being our immediate neighbor, those are the areas we're looking at so that we'll be able to pick you in case there's any excess debt because different countries had employed different strategies towards working towards COVID. I think that covers the port of entry. Low mortality reporting, we also looked at those counties that were really reporting very low levels. So we could deploy this particular thing in the health facility and see how well or how well the health facilities will be able to change their kind of reporting and we'll be able to get more data about the deaths that were happening in those particular areas. We also looked at regional representation. Remember our country is a little bit big. So we wanted to get a test of the different regions that we had. And most importantly, we also picked counties that had a functional community unit. I, um, I don't know if you're aware, but in Kenya, we are running a health community-based health provision whereby the community is the first point of contact for health services before someone is referred to a primary level of care. And then they are either escalated up depending on what is the condition they've had. And lastly, the country is piloting something called universal health care. So those counties were picked in those manner to ensure that they'd be able to get them. If you're familiar with Kenya, probably later you can be able to look at these counties and the areas we picked was Nairobi because of the COVID-19 button, button and point of entry, Mombasa for the same, same reason. Busia is a border county and this is a point of entry. Kajiado, Machakos, which is to give a regional representation and it's a very good established community units and the USC county. And lastly, Sierra, which is a regional representation and also a border county because it does border the Lake Victoria on the other side, which also touches on Uganda. So I'll probably go to the first instance and be able to show you what is it that we deployed in the system. So the deployment of the app in the system is that we developed an app and it's important to note that as WHO has made it a recommendation for health that by the end of, by 2022, we should start reporting mobility using the ICD-11. This platform gave us a very, very good, good a very, very good avenue to be able to roll out the ICD-11 and be able to see how our facilities and those within our areas will be able to do our reporting and engage with those data reporting. So 
once you land on our site, this is where you'd be able to go. And the next thing is that the tracker instance that we've been using, I think those of you who are familiar with the event-based reporting, which is a program within the DHIS2 module, it runs on that. And once someone has been able to log in, this is what they'll be able to see. On the left, they'll be able to pick an, the landing page, which would clearly give you a site. It's important for me to mention that our reporting units for this particular was health facility. So we have the Kenyan hierarchy, which arranges our facility according to our administrative units, where we have Kenya, and within Kenya, we have something called counties. And within the counties, we have sub-counties. And within sub-counties, we have what I think the next slide will be able to give you what I'm talking about. That is in Kenya, we have Kenya. A good example is that Baringo County. And within Baringo County, we would have something called a sub-county, which is Baringo Central Sub-County. And then within the sub-county, we would have which are known as a ward. And within the ward is where the facilities are laid. So a good example of what you're all seeing on the screen is that uh, this is a classical case of somebody working in Baringo County Referral, and this is what they'll be able to get in. Important to remind those who are familiar with these use cases that depending on the user role, we could be able to limit you to only the particular area which you're working. So that, for example, if you're working in Baringo County Referral, when you land on this page, you'll only be able to enter data for Baringo. And that is something that we find very positive because the user role helps you ensure that data quality is adhered very well at data collection point. This is probably how it looks at. And the important key, I think, as you can see the screen, is you'll be able to look at the ad event. And once you click the ad events, to be able to take you through the system and give you how you'll be able to report a particular death. So this is how immediately an event was captured. We, as a system, have ensured to reduce data errors. You can see the first row on the system to be able to quickly pick all your events. That is your basic events details. That is, for example, this is an event being reported on the 11th, 10th, 11th 10th of no November, and it's from Baringo County, the Baringo sub-county, and the Baringo County referral hospital. This area auto-populates, so there is no need for someone to be able to enter them. Then this again, the various things for those who work in data that ensure that data being collected at least quality aspects are being considered very prior to it. So on the first part, this is mainly the picking of the demographic. The things that we were able to keep pick were the date notification. Let us remember kindly, I did not mention that when a death occurs in Kenya, there is a form known as a date D1, a date notification form. And when it's filled, it's filled up. Part of that data is what will be able to be transferred here. But not only that, what is in the form, but also what exists within the patient file to be able to inform the part of cause of death. So this would basically be the screen where we were able to pick our demographic data, the county, the sub-county, the usual residence, and all the sex and everything that go with it. Yes or no, like or not, if you realize in the area rich in sex, in Kenya, we've had a lot of activism and to now health is being required to collect our data, both for male, female, and the unisex. I think that's a good one you can pick from us. Then the next thing to look at is we're collecting data of the medical data. And a beautiful thing to notice here is that the preceding causes of death, which would have been captured from the report, would be able to be captured in the section listen A and B. And if you are not able to select or pick one on the far right, all the details of that particular incidents, the system will not be able to save. So we require you to pick A, to pick B, to pick C. And if there's more than one antecedent cause of death, all of it will be captured. And if you look at the area, state the underlying cause of death, the system will automatically pick the last row, which has been filled up there, so that that will be able to be picked as the last cause of death. And uh, within the system, that means, for example, we could be able to pick what, what is this thing causing our excess deaths within our health facility all around. The next thing we're looking at is uh, other medical data. This is basically for those conditions. I think some of you are familiar how death appears occurs in the facility. We looked at those who, that are related to surgery, whether an autopsy was done, and the manner of death, and lastly, if it was a poisoning or not. And uh, what is beautiful is that once the health facility records officer had been able to enter all this into the system, they'd be able to complete the form and the form would be able to be uploaded very quickly into the DHIS2 platform, which is our KHIS tracker. Now, 
<clears throat> what are some of the strategies we did in about to ensure that at least this thing will be able to be picked? Now, being that ICD 11 has not been rolled out in the country, we needed to do capacity building for health records of some of the system. And we were able to train 220. And as I've shown clearly at the beginning, we're only working with six counties so far. So we trained them very, very well. And this has been a very, very good for us because due to the interest in learning ICD-11, it has meant that most of them have been able to capture and report very effectively. Remembering again that deaths does happen on facility, but on average, the large facilities would have maybe a 10 to 15 deaths happening in a day, but the minimal small low level facility level four working at the district, they'll probably have two or three. And this made it easier for those at the records to be able to quickly move in. Daily reporting was really emphasized and uh, there's a tracking of who was reported on who has not been able to report. And lastly, I think some of you have been able to look work with the program, you'll realize we really worked on the graphic user interface so that whatever the health worker who's reporting was interacting with on the screen, they'd be able to be very, very easy and simple to be able to enter. We realized that with the digitalization, especially of most of our records, most of the thing we've been doing is we've been making the forms more of the digital version. And that hinders how well or how easy our health workers are able to interact with it. So there are achievements so far that we've had 100% reporting by all, all the six county health facilities to do this. And it's important to mention, these are both the government, private and health and uh, faith-based facility. We've got a positive responses. We've managed to separate mortality reporting from mobility. Kenya has more than one use case of the tracker instance or the program instance. So one of the few things we did with this is we were able to separate reporting of mortality separate from the reporting of mobility. We did realize that when you combine them, mortality and mobility, whereby what differentiates them is mode of discharge, whether it's death or alive, it was really becoming cumbersome for health workers to report deaths because someone looks at the forms and realizes there's so many and maybe there are only three deaths there. And deaths is what was of our interest. Other counties are now asking us to be unclear in the next phase. And we've actually, the most importantly is that the fact that we were able to deploy the ICD-11 within the system and it's, what I need to mention is that it's, it is intelligent in that it re reduces the need for the clinician or whoever is entering data to know the disease. Those of you who've worked with ICD-11, I think you'll agree with me. I just need to type malaria until it will give me all the forms of malaria are available and it will be able to tell me which one I am looking for and quickly pick it up. Now, our challenges as we've been deploying this particular system is internet connectivity. I think Kenya remains one of those countries where internet implementation is very, very good. But again, the connectivity cost has been quite of our major entrances, but we've asked the health facility to support it. A big gap that exists within the KHIS program is the ability to analyze the data because now we need to transfer the data, either download it via Excel or CCSV and move it to Anacode or Mamacode so that, for example, if someone was to ask me what has been the top 10 cause of death for this particular facility, we need to take it to another platform to analyze it. So it's a gap that exists within the DHIS2 platform. And maybe I believe as we keep working on it and improving on it, we'll find a way to make analysis very, very easy. Now, the capacity of coders and certifier to use SD11 remains a challenge. I think those of you, I don't know any other country where they've been able to do it very well, but you'll be able to realize that 90% of, 60% of people will be able to reporting in the death certificate that cause of death is cardiopulmonary arrest and it stops there. Whereas the other subsequent or antecedent causes that made the patient appear in the health facility, so that the cardiovascular thing that has been written there makes sense, remains a challenge. So those have been our major challenges. And what is our way steps or the next steps as we move? We are really looking at piloting in six additional counties so that we can broaden our sample size and we can be able to say whether in Kenya we really had excess deaths. We're also looking at monitoring the rapid mortality cell pilot process and data quality assurance so that whatever data we are able to share, we can be able to tell the population what, what was the quality, was it good or bad? Data analysis and computation, I think uh, that is something we're doing at the moment so that we can be able to say, have we experienced excess deaths because of COVID or have the deaths just remained within the normal thresholds? Documentation, lessons learned and experience, secondary data analysis of historical data to triangulate with prospective reporting of RMS. Lastly, disseminating these findings 
to our leadership so that they're able to involve and inform policy and stakeholders at all levels. The Kenya health is devolved function. So in anything that we do from the national level, we need to be able to cascade it down to the county level so that they're able to understand what is it exactly you are doing. Lastly, we have been able to scale up the RMS to for the, all the 47 counties and make the mortality reporting of death to be a very, very thing that is part of our routine data. I believe I will stop there. I hope I was not very fast, but I believe my last slide will be a thank you and question, sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Wesley, for your nice presentation uh, from his Kenya. Um, just want to reiterate uh, to the participant that uh, if you have any question um, to the facilitator or some of the content which the presenter have made, please go to the question channel in the Slack and uh, post your question there. Also tag, tag the facilitator. Um, now we'll be shifting to a uh, presentation to from his Tanzania. Wesley, can you? I'm trying uh, to get the button. I'm trying to get the button. I don't know who else can help me. Let's be now. Um. Just, Just yeah, I think that should be fine. I hope everyone can um, see the, um, the slide deck. Uh, here with me today, I have um, I have um, an m and &E officer from the Ministry of Health. Uh, his name is uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Inkiligi. Uh, he's coming from the um, TB tuberculosis and leprosy um, national program. He'll be taking us through the presentation on how they have managed to implement a national-wide uh, electronic TB register in Tanzania. Welcome. Thank you. Very afraid. Good, good, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, here is a presentation from the National TB and the Gapros program on the on the TV and the Lepros electronic system, which we call it the ETL. Yeah, the TB and the Lepros program is a combined two disease program established in 1977 to oversee the control of TB and the Lepros. It is under the preventative services that in the section of the epidemiology. It is headed by the program manager, a senior medical officers. Yeah, uh, the tat, 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 Tanzania is a poor author the WHO and the UA. You a trade standard in providing the B services. Previously, the program operated on the two system and the electrode, electrode, the one and the paper based system. 
at the district and the higher le level. And the, a paper only at the facility. So th there was the two evaluation or assessment, the epidemiological and the, the impact analysis, and also the evaluation of the TV's surveillance system in 2013 and 2014, which all, all revealed the ETR and net system, which was on operation on that, 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 that system. And on that year, there was also a, a new WHO definition and the reporting framework, which also necessitated the updating of the recording and the reporting tools. Also, I think the coming of the NDTB strategy which he demanded for in-depth analysis. Yes, they are all going to push the program to adapt to a KC-based system. So that is where the electronic TB and the date was the GSITL started and the it, it, it is a web based developed in the HS2 platform. The initial version for TB part consisted of three registers the TB registers for susceptible and the registers for black resistant TB, and also a Register for culture and the DST results. So it provides a simple way to correct case level data in a systematic manner at facility level, although some of the data are being entered at the this week label that for a particular health facility. So from the system, we are able to generate standardized report, which allow has analysis, and also to use the pivot table and to export the case basically to other software for other further analysis. So here is how the milestone was from 2006, where we start, started the ETL.net, which was a, a stand alone up to 2018 when we adapted the current system the case based system in the HS2 platform. So, during the implementation, we conducted a pilot in three regions, portraying of the 22 districts, which included the, the Diwani MDR TB treatment center at that. that that period. So we trained the district and the legion of TB and the different coordinators and also the regional HMS focal person staff. So the, we did a joint support supervision with the program and the developers of the system, the University of Islam or his Tanzania, and uh, we assisted the, the, the data entry.
so taller we have with this coordinate chain, but you hope we can continue. So, so here is the data and screen, which have the, the data entry, well, highly level and the, the stages. So the, the, the demographic information, they are both on the profile and the other information which cannot be and not to, 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 to be ca ca captured yet to once they are put at the st stages like, like the HIV, the treatment, and the laboratory test results. Okay, here is the some of the dashboard which can be generated from the system. And also here is a sample of the standard report, which can is your data customizable, so the user can generate it automatically and include some of the most frequent needed to be indicators. And the author that has the same reporting for liberals. So what we left as we, we we are not expecting that there was a high acceptance rate of the system by the users at different levels at region at the district and at the sum of the few facilities which we are able to do the data entry them, themselves. Also the information on interoperability among the TB register, DLR, and the catch and the ST. So we needed also the patient transfer and the referrals to be in and also the specimen transport and that, that that are one, one of the information we are needed by the users and they are happy with that to be obtained and captured in the system. Other with that the ICT infrastructure is closure for the success of the system and the data variability at sub-national level and the level for depth and analysis of the TB cases and treatment. So the little time data monitoring and analysis was possible at all levels. Mentorship after training, it was helpful and we were able to solve the problem after at the summit for the doctor entrant. And also we need to improve the computer skills and the doctor use capacities at the facility to the health care workers. So area of the improvement or the improvement that data extraction features. As uh, we know, most of the users at lower level, they are not, not, uh, not have the data computer skills. So we needed to have a simpler extraction features to enable them to, to use especially to generate the report, also to improve the data use or the information use. Also, we needed to build capacity on the data review. 
but it definitely and analysis at the all levels to enable or to prolong more for the data you see at the lower level. Also, we learned to involve the healthcare workers at the facility level to use the system. The ongoing planning, which is how some who have been implemented, was also to scale up the use of the system. At the health facility, to develop the offline model for the data entry, which we have opted for the mobile system, although we are in process of de developing it. And then they also we developed the uh, SOPs to en enable or to as a simplified user for the users for, for the use and the other is to include the data quality assessment or assurance and the supportive supervision checklist in the system, in the DHS2 system. And also we are planning to develop a data monitoring and the management guideline, which can comprise much of the on the data and the data analysis and the use for all levels. And now we are still support or inside the utilization of the space system at all levels. Currently at a facility, we are still a few facilities using the system, but, but we are promoting for the facility which have uh, infrastructure, computer and the electricity to do the data entry direct. Can other country benefit? Yes. The test based system can you know, be implemented in resource constrained countries. For what you need is the external to support the local expertise, also to focus on the country context, e.g., who at what level to enter the data, how the ICT can assist in the poor ICT environment, and the author the close mentorship and the support which is needed to the initial roll up to stage, stage and the author to, to go stepwise approach and rolling up the system. So that is what we did, we did to roll out the ETL uh, Sante Nisana. Thank you very much, Mr. Ankiligi, for the uh, for the um, uh, for the presentation. Um, so uh, after going through multiple presentation um, from uh, his Uganda, his Kenya, his Rwanda, his Malawi, now his Tanzania, I think you have um, gained a taste of um, different use cases where they have used um, DHS2 tracker to um uh to to collect information and also use it and our uh, coming uh, academy will be focusing more on the tracker use how now you can use this information uh to inform either your program um you are you are your country or more or less your data managers within um, your organization um 
So for today, this will be uh, the last um, presentation use case. Uh, we hope you have uh, enjoyed and I see there's a lot of questions which our participants you have um, um, post. Uh, our team of facilitators will be visiting the Slack channel named questions and they'll be kind of responding to all of your questions in, um, in, uh, as the days progress. If you have more questions, please do not hesitate to post it there, uh, feel free. Uh, tomorrow's session will be starting at uh, 2 p.m. Uh, East African time. Um, please um, join up early. Uh, tomorrow we'll try our level best to start at 2 p.m. Um, um, East African time. Um, yes, uh, I've seen a question here that uh, the presentation, yes, the presentation, all presentation will be uploaded into the Moodle. I uh, will be using a platform called Moodle to host all of our materials and resources, including uh, the videos which we are um, recording in these particular sessions. So Hadija, our coordinator, academic coordinator, will be uh, sharing with you academy, um, I would say academy welcome guide, where it will have all the necessary information for you for this particular academy, including uh, the links or how you can enroll yourself in this uh, Moodle platform and other platform which we'll be uh, using. So thank you very much for your attendance um, and participation and um, your questions as well. Uh, we hope we've learned a lot and I'll uh, see you tomorrow, 2 p.m. East African time where we'll start our session tomorrow, which will talk more about the um, new features for the DHS2 tracker. Thank you and uh, good evening. <laughs>